Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are speaking with Matt Ho. Matt is a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy, has been since 2010, uh, resigned from the U.S. State Department in Afghanistan over its uh, crimes and outrages in Afghanistan in 2009, and was the winner of the Ridenauer Prize for Truth Telling in 2021. Uh, Matt Ho is a member of more boards and advisory boards than we probably have time for, including being on the board of directors of the Institute for Public Accuracy, the advisory board of the Committee to Defend Julian Assange, uh, Civil Liberties, Exposed Facts, North Carolina Committee to Investigate Torture, the Resistance Center for Peace and Justice, Veterans for Peace, World Beyond War, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Matt Ho, you're doing great work. Uh, thanks for coming on Talk World Radio. Well, thanks, David. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me with you. It's great to see you uh, and to have seen your work in recent weeks. Um, let's talk about Ukraine first, I guess. Uh, where do you think things stand? Well, we, we've we've had the Ukrainians launch their offensive, which uh, was in the making for many, many months, goes back to, I think, December, maybe we first start hearing about this. And it seems as if for many in the West, this will be the axle. This will be uh, either where uh, the great Ukrainian victory occurs and Russia collapses, which most, I think, including myself, believe is highly unlikely. And um, the reality or, or the other aspect would be the reality sets in that this is a war that's stalemated. That's not winnable by either side, uh, that there is no pathway to military victory, and that uh, negotiations to end the war are what is needed, what are, what's paramount, uh, what should be a priority. Um, and so, I, you know, I am, I think maybe I'm in the minority here, but I am cautiously optimistic uh, about Ukraine. I mean, certainly the killing is occurring right now, the destruction is occurring, the, the environment environmental damage is incalculable. Uh, there's the danger of escalation, which is ever present. And something that cannot be understated is this danger of the war expanding, of it becoming a war that crosses over borders, brings in other countries, and potentially leads to uh, the nuclear third world war that we've all been living under the shadow of for 80 years now. Uh, but I am cautiously optimistic that uh, a ceasefire and negotiations may be occurring in the next several months uh, simply because the reality war is setting into so many people that this is a stalemated war uh, that cannot be won. And, uh, you know, the best thing that may occur, which would be a cruel peace, would be a frozen conflict where basically the guns go silent, uh, similar to Korea in 1953. There's a there's an armistice. armistice whether it's formal or informal or informal, um, but that 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 is, uh, uh, I think, what may be occurring, what hopefully will be occurring, because even as imperfect as that is, even as terrible as that is, this idea that Russia is somehow rewarded for its actions, at least the devastation, the destruction, the killing is stopped, uh, and there's a potential then going forward for negotiations to broker some sort of settlement that gets to the grievances that eventually dissolves the disputes here. But in the current moment, as I say all this, the killing still occurs, the the destruction still occurs, and the danger of escalation is ever present. It seems to me, Matt Ho, that and maybe I'm being the pessimist glass half empty voice here, but not only do both sides persist in this delusion that they're about to win as they have been for months and months and months uh but in addition both sides are firmly locked in to the unacceptability of giving anything to the other side and insisting on total victory on top of which it seems to me that this syndrome is now kicking in of don't let them have died in vain. Like you've killed yeah. all these people, therefore you must kill more. You see this in every country's wars, U.S. wars uh, included. You've you got to kill more people because of the people you've killed already. And that's that seems to be growing, I think. 
Yeah, you know, and I would if I was if we were doing this in a written exchange, uh, cautiously optimistic, the cautiously would be in all caps, bold, italicized, <laughs> right? Um, and it's true, and you know, certainly are the public pronouncements that that's the the what what both sides are saying. If you look at what Ukraine says about its conditions uh, for negotiations, it's tantamount to, to you know, it, it basically says Russia has to to end the war and, and leave our, our 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 territories, including Crimea. And the Russians, uh, you know, their demands are equally uh, uh, non-starters for the Ukrainians. Um, however, I think that if I, I, what I think is possible is that elements within both sides there, including the U.S., can see that there are benefits to a frozen conflict that exceed the current risks of the current war. So whereas you have the potential for this war to become uh, to go out of control, to, to uh, un, like all wars, unintended consequences, unknowable consequences, unpredictable consequences to come about that are uh, uh, outside the realm of, of anyone's uh, ability to uh, maintain them or predict them or control them. I think the idea that First, there are some elements within both the Russian, the Ukrainian, and American camps, to include the Brits and, and, and NATO and Brussels, that see the value in this frozen conflict, that this uh, continues the grievances, this continues the uh, 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 this this continues the reason for uh, uh, the warmongering, if not the war itself. Right. So this justifies for the Ukrainian, the U.S. and NATO side, then the further provision of F-16s, of missiles, of building up the Ukrainian army into something that resembles uh, NATO standard armies. Uh, certainly the idea of, of rushing tanks to uh, Ukraine, Russian air defense systems to Ukraine, Russian other other weapon systems to Ukraine, and to see them destroyed almost immediately knowing that the stocks that the NATO militaries have, the U.S. military has, cannot replenish them. And if you look and you see now, now I think you see where the, the war industry thinks this is a good deal for us as well, because now you can start talking about getting into long-term contracts, right? So now you have this idea, well, well, we can now get into contracts with Ukraine to deliver 200 Abrams tanks over the next five years for $12 billion or whatever it would be. Now then you get to the economic reconstruction of this as well. And we know that Goldman Sachs has already made deals with Ukraine to rebuild their country for hundreds of billions of dollars, probably running into the trillions if, if Iraq and Afghanistan and other uh, Western reconstruction efforts are used as a model. So you see the benefit there to the financiers, the banks of this going into a frozen conflict. And the same, I think, the same on Russia it gives them a chance to reset if they can, if they can meet the minimum of what their goals were. If Putin can say, "Look, my goal going in was not to destroy Ukraine, but to protect the Russian people in eastern Ukraine, to reestablish our, uh, our, our, to reestablish uh, uh, the old boundaries of Russia, to give us a buffer from NATO, to stand up to the West." All these goals that he had, all these things that he had, all these objectives he had, if he can say, look, and we have met that, we have done that, we have destroyed the Ukrainian army, we now control uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, we now have a corridor to Crimea, so Crimea is contiguous with Russia. You know, if he can then present that, I think that gives him a golden bridge, as uh, I believe it was a Chinese uh, 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 military tactician, Sun Tzu said, 2000 years ago, or however long that was, a way for him to get out. So I, I think that this is the best chance, even as imperfect and as terrible as it would be. And I think if you can get some degree of rational uh, decision making here, which I know is a big ask, it's a big ask. But, you know, I'm trying at this point, I think, to find ways forward that deliver an end to this conflict, deliver an end to this war as quickly as possible. And maybe I shouldn't use an end because, use the word an end, because it would just, in my view, what you would get would be that frozen conflict where there would be an end to the large scale combat. Maybe you'd have artillery duels at some point, they'd fire missiles, there'd be sabotage, 
But again, the wholesale slaughter, the, the, the mass destruction, and the uh, dangerous escalation possibilities would be drastically reduced. Sometimes I think the only way they could reach a settlement would be uh, for both sides to back off militarily. Ukraine gets Russia the heck out and Russia gets NATO the heck out and Ukraine right. won't join NATO. But when it comes to the land, the territories, that they have globally observed and controlled elections and the people of Donbass and the people of Crimea get to decide what happens to them. And other times I think, yeah, I'm listening to the propaganda too much. Both of these sides hate democracy more than they hate anything else. Uh, what, I, what I don't think Ukraine is within a million miles of accepting Russia getting uh, those territories. I, I think this is where U.S. leverage has to come into play. And it, this is probably this is as big as if as 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 saying that Putin and the Russian government are going to agree to this. This idea of the United States using its leverage, which is massive on Ukraine to push a deal like this, uh, this idea for the Ukrainians that perhaps the U.S. money that doesn't just keep their military fighting. And we should say it barely keeps their military fighting. I was listening the other day. Uh, Ukraine needs, you know, a million uh, artillery shells a month. The U.S. can only produce about 400,000 and the Europeans can only produce about 50,000. So as we've seen throughout, the and, and the, the ability of the West to continue supplying the Ukrainians with military uh, munitions, equipment, vehicles, et cetera, like it has over the last 16 months is rapidly diminishing. The other aspect is that, and this is where I think the you know, now you get into the domestic politics of the U.S. and the Republicans in Congress who are opposed to all this money going to Ukraine, not because they don't believe in the geopolitical whims of it, but because they feel that U.S. money should be spent killing Chinese rather than killing Russians. And I think what you see then then is the danger of the collapse of American economic support to Ukraine. And if that were to occur, if the tens of billions of dollars that the United States has already put into the Ukrainian government, keeping it afloat, paying the salaries, not just of the military, but of all government workers, paying the pensions of, of, of Ukrainians, if that was to collapse, if that was to end, what kind of collapse would you have in Ukraine within a matter of days, weeks? And that is the leverage that the United States has here. And so what you then offer the Ukrainians and is, look, for those far right ultra naturalists who, yeah, who want to keep fighting the Russians forever, this is their purpose in life to fight the Russians. Well, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to subsidize you. We're going to underwrite you. You will get to complain and yell and bitch about the Russians for the rest of your lives because they are going to be controlling this. They, you're going to have this contested territory in the East. I think, I think that is the type of uh, modus vende, right? That would allow the hardliners in Ukraine to say, you know what, this is lesser risk and is a benefit to us more than the uh, continued war with Russia that can end up going badly, either because the US and West can no longer provide support or stop providing support. There's some type of Ukrainian army collapse. Russia pulls out some type of, you know, strategic. Uh, 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 a move that is just brilliant. I doubt that. But you know I mean all the unknown possibilities, I think the idea that you can have this forever war going on east of Ukraine with less risk than you have now, I think that could be the appeal to the Ukrainian hardliners. And that would be the appeal to the Russians as well. And this is what I said, you know, a year ago that if I was Joe Biden, I would have gone and said this to uh, uh, I would have said this to uh, the Ukrainian government. And I also would have gone to Russia. And I would have said to Vladimir Putin, I would have said, look, you know, Mr. President, we just spent the United States just spent eight trillion dollars on wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We can fund this war forever. We have the world's reserve currency. Now, of course, we're doing our best to lose that status. However, you know, we have an unlimited supply of money that we can keep this thing going forever. We can keep the Ukrainian government 
going forever. I know you do not want an occupation because you know what we went through in Iraq. You know what we went through in Afghanistan. You what you know what we you went through in Afghanistan. We saw how you conducted your affairs in Chechnya. An occupation was not your goal in the sense of having some type of constant insurgency. That's what you will deal with on a much larger level in Ukraine. And so I think that would be the appeal to Putin to see this is a less risky, more beneficial golden bridge out of this war. Uh, and again, it preserves the war in a, in a frozen conflict, Cold War, uh, you know, border fight type, uh, uh, forever war type situation that both sides then can continue to use the other side as the boogeyman. And for the Americans, of course, that allows a transition to prepare for a war with China, which, you know, I'm really as cautiously optimistic. And again, I especially cautious that maybe this war in Ukraine could be over in the fall or at least be a frozen conflict by the fall. You know, don't hold me to that. You know, I'm again, very cautious in what I'm saying here. However, I think a year from now, David, you and I could be having very serious conversations about the very beginnings of war with China, and particularly after 2024, uh, in 2025, I think the conversations are going to be very serious and very concerned. Uh, no doubt, uh, a deal that ends up giving organizing tools to Nazis in Ukraine and <laughs> starting the United States on its plans for a war with China requires a couple of follow-up steps at the, at the very least, <laughs> I would say. Uh, but, you know, we burn those bridges when we come to them because the, getting away from the nuclear uh, right. disaster is the first step, no question. Um I, right. I, it's, it's, I mean, I, it's terrible all around. There's nothing. And this is, but this gets to the point of everything I have learned in my life, everything you have, have, have worked so hard on, all the things I've learned from you and organizations like World Beyond War, that war is the absolute worst way to do things. It is, it, there, there, nothing good is going to come with this. And, and, and no matter how big the white hat you think you are wearing, in the sense that this is some type of Manichaean struggle of good versus evil, this is, uh, you know, to protect Western democracy from, uh, you know, uh, 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 authoritarian regimes that want to reconquer Europe or, or whatever the, the, the notion is. Um, no matter how big that white hat is, war is going to deliver consequences that are unpredictable, unintended, and most likely much, much, much worse than anything that could have been arrived either through negotiations or by doing nothing. And I think that's one of the case with Ukraine. And there were, I mean, we could go into all the different ways that negotiations could have occurred, how there was dipl diplomatic malpractice for decades regarding Ukraine, that this is a war that didn't have to happen, um, all the different options that were available for both sides. But fundamentally, both sides could have literally done nothing, just continued to make statements and yell at each other, drive their tanks up and down the border, and the world will be a much, much better place. So even nothing is better than what has occurred over the last, you know, eight years, nine years in Ukraine. And of course, if, if say, something like the Minsk II Accords have been filed, which would have done exactly as you were describing, David, you know, this idea of creating some type of uh, autonomous zone in the East, uh, where you would have referendums that would establish uh, the governance of Eastern Ukraine, uh, you know, you could, you would, you would have a, a more or less a neutral area, a demilitarized area. All these things are very possible. Lots of people have already spoken of them. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, France, and Germany signed accords in 2015 to that effect. Uh, basically, you know, the negotiations that were occurring uh, in the immediate weeks of the war that were hosted in Turkey, that the Israelis were involved with basically or along those lines. So you see, I think the idea of where this could go uh, and how it could be resolved and getting that 75, 80% solution on this over the next you know, several years is possible, but that can't be achieved until there's a ceasefire, uh, you know, and until the, the, the possibilities of escalation are taken away. 
It's very interesting, Matt Ho, that you say both sides could have just done nothing because I have very good friends, longtime friends and allies uh, with deep understanding of war as the most evil thing, as you were just discussing, who in some cases are telling me that Russia literally had no choice whatsoever but to go to war. Uh, people like our friend Ray McGovern are telling me this and others uh, probably in greater numbers telling me the exact same line from the Ukrainian side, people like John Pfeffer at Institute for Policy Studies and many others, Ukraine had literally no choice but to go to war. Um, maybe they're both right. Maybe one of them's right. I happen to think they're both wrong and 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 disgustingly and outrageously and immorally and very disappointingly wrong. Uh, but what's what's your view? Yeah, one, I think I think, you know, you're on the right track and I'm, I'm pretty certain that you've had you, you've been having this experience as well. When when you make a statement about the war in Ukraine, when you put out your thoughts, you get yelled at as both a Putin apologist and as a NATO imperialist. Oh, yeah. And I think when when you make a statement about this war that has that degree of neutrality and objectivity to it. That's what you're going to get. You're going to get the, the, those who are emotional about it, who see this as their team, who do believe that they are the ones wearing the white hats, that this is a, that this is a war of good versus evil, a, a, an eternal Manichaean struggle. Uh, and I think what you found is that many who have been a part of the anti-war movement and part of the peace movement for years, uh, their foundation is not based upon the principles that war is not the answer. Their foundation is not based upon the idea that war will only lead to worse things happening, that the suffering, the death, the destruction of war on its own, let alone the consequences that come from it, say you invade Iraq and there was no Al-Qaeda there, and now there's an Al-Qaeda, uh, which then becomes the Islamic State, which then occupies half of Syria and half of Iraq, you know, like those types of things, you know, you, which, you know, just the suffering, the death, the destruction that occurs far in a way outweighs any benefit that could be achieved from the war, from initiating the war, from conducting the war. But then, too, you have to add on what those consequences are and, you know, what the consequences may be, what the consequences will be. You know, and I always go back to the Romans and their understanding of war and uh, their uh, way that their god of war, Mars, was in their pantheon of, of, of gods and goddesses. And, you know, the priority they gave him, the, 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 the dignity, uh, if you can call it that, that they gave him. The, the, you know, if you went and you, sat, you went and sacrificed to a, another god or goddess, you'd sacrifice a dove or a goat or something. Mars, you had to sacrifice a bull. But the idea being is that with all those gods and goddesses, they represented forces outside the control of human of humans, right? So you got us of love because we've all dealt with that force before, you know, and the God, the God of, of oceans and, you know, those kinds of things, right? I mean, things in the God of war, because war is outside the control of man. I think history is, is replete with examples of anyone who thought they could control war, finding out very uh, dramatically uh, and very catastrophically that war is uncontrollable. It's a force of its own. You know, in my own personal life, I found this. I thought that I could go to the Iraq war and be a moral actor in the Iraq war that around me, what I would do would be good, right? I would, I would, I would be a moral agent amidst the war, which was completely foolish, completely stupid, uh, you know, uh, because you cannot be your own agent. Something that vast, something that forceful, something that, uh, 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 metaphysical, if you will, uh, is will make you an agent of it. So you go to war, think you're going to be your own moral agent. No, you become an immoral agent of the war. That's the way it works. So I, I think all these things, these notions have been left behind because people are so swept up in the emotion of supporting one side against the other, about of following almost some type of, in some cases, romantic version of this, that this is uh, you know, we haven't had a good war since 1945. This is the opportunity. We are defending freedom and liberty and democracy against 
the hordes from you know the outside while they're just saying this is a is a, a war of liberation that this is a war of one nation going and protecting its people from a corrupt uh you know a a, a corrupt racist uh regime uh that is you know bent on genocide you know and those are the arguments you hear and those are very emotional arguments and yes there's maybe there's some truth to them but again if you come to this place where you realize the futility of war the danger of war the horror of war then i think you have to stand on that principle and i also go back to and like as we look through history i go back to what what i think i think it was noam chomsky who you know said that the only you know in all his research all his 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 studying the only time he ever saw anything that kind of resembled a, a a good war if you will uh was the vietnamese intervention into uh cambodia uh, to dispose of the Pol Pot regime. And, you know, I mean, I say that not knowing enough about it to even put my own perspective on it, other than the fact that I know the Pol Pot regime killed a quarter of their people and was backed by the United States and was empowered because of the United States. You know, I mean, but but if that's what Chomsky's saying, that there's oh, no, everything he's looked at, there's only one out of all the wars that you could say, okay, this was an intervention that was justifiable. Well, what does that tell you about well, everything else we're going to do in the future, that's not going to be justifiable in hindsight. And then again, as we keep saying, more than likely, the consequences are going to be catastrophic. Well, if your only justification for war was a war to overthrow a dictatorship created by a war, uh, it's, it's a little <laughs> weak. Uh, and, if, and if you're going to hold that superior to nonviolent campaigns that might have overthrown that dictatorship, I, you know, I, I'm not right. so... We, we've right. got about three minutes left, Matt Ho. I, I think, you know, when, when priests would get a poor family to sacrifice a bull, those people were going to continue believing in the God of war because if they stop now, they look like idiots, right? <laughs> right. right. If you send people to Iraq with the WMD lies, you know, we had, there were surveys done of showing people the evidence and they come out believing the lies more strongly than ever uh, because, you know, people have gone and killed and died for this. I'm not going to stop believing in it. I'm going to believe in it all the more for the horrors it's produced. H how did you overcome that? How did you not say, I'm going to believe this nonsense even more strongly because of the, the hell they sent me into? Oh, I had to lie to myself repeatedly for years. Uh, I mean, I had to come up with new lies, new justifications. I had to had to uh, tell myself that, you know, again, like I was going there, I was going to be a moral actor. And then it was, well, you know, I can take care of the people around me. Or when I, I'm a, I'm a junior level, mid-level guy. And so by the time I become a senior level guy, though, I'll be doing things differently. And I can tell you that when I went in the Marine Corps at the end of the 90s and 98, we still had a lot of colonels and a lot of generals and a lot of sergeants major who all who had been in Vietnam and who all stood in front of us and said, you know, I was in Vietnam. We will never let that happen again. And then within a few years, we were in two Vietnams. Right. I mean, so the, the, the there's other aspects, too. I think of people who go along with it. The golden handcuffs are very real. I mean, a number of times after I resigned from the State Department that I heard from people who would be like, man, I wish I could do what you did, but I got three kids going to college. I mean, that was probably the thing I heard the most, like that type of, of practical excuse, if you can call it that, right? It, but it is, it, you lie to yourself. Uh, it, it's, it's, and it, this is the crux then of moral injury, where something you believed in, something that you gave your life to, something that you were willing to give your life for, something that uh, was your foundation, who you were, well, it betrays you, right? And there's two aspects of moral injury, one being betrayed by your country, by an institution, by an organization, as many were who went to war in Iraq or went to war in Vietnam, went to war in Afghanistan. I think right now you see in Afghanistan where the Taliban have reduced the poppy, poppy, poppy crop by 85%. And now people are starting to say, well, maybe the Taliban weren't running the drug trade in Afghanistan. Maybe it really was the drug lords we put and kept in power for 20 years who were running the drug. I think you're now seeing, um, right, you know, you're now seeing that where people are saying we were betrayed, we were lied to. And then on the individual level with moral injury, the idea is that you've transgressed your own values. 
So that good person, that moral person you thought you were, you were, you didn't have a white hat on, you had a black hat on. Good time to change hats. We've been speaking with Matthew Ho. We'll have links to his work up at talkworldradio.org. Matt, thank you very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.